With the recent closing of IMO 2024 two weeks ago, there was one problem from day one that caught people's attention. And that problem is the disgustingly hard problem 3. This problem got only 17 solves in contest out of over 600 contestants. 9 out of these 17 souls made some minor mistakes and did not get the perfect 7 meaning that only 1.3% or 8 contestants got a perfect score. While the solution might not seem that intuitive at first, being just another long bashy problem, there's actually an underlying structure that ties everything together. And this problem to me demonstrates the power of visualization. In today's episode, I am going to present IMO 2024 Problem 3. The problem states that let A1, A2, A3, and so on be an infinite sequence of positive integers, and let n be a positive integer. I am going to change the variable name a bit. Suppose that for each k larger than n, a k is equal to the number of times that a k minus 1 appears in the list a1, a2 to a k minus 1. Basically, this holds for all sufficiently large k. And we are asked to prove that at least one of the sequences a1, a3, a5, and so on, or a2, a4, a6, and so on, is eventually periodic. So, if we look at this problem, it looks like just a regular sequence problem, but there's some condition that makes it strange in a special way, which is the frequency condition. This means that we cannot cut off some part of the sequence and generate a new one that follows the rules. Everything from the first number matters even when the sequence goes really large, right? And if you look at it, there's some alternation going on between the big and small numbers. Like in this example, I started with these three starting numbers that don't have to obey any rules, but from the fourth number onwards, it has to obey the rule. Like two here is the frequency of one, two here is the frequency of two, three here is the frequency of two. And this goes on until eventually these ones are going to repeat, and it is the R sequence that's going to repeat. But why does this happen? Why are the big numbers alternated with the small numbers? There seems to be a duality going on be between the large numbers, we know, a duality between size and frequency, right? It is like the size of this number is the frequency of the previous number. And the frequency of this number is the size of the next. There is some relationship similar to like two sides of the same coin going on. And we want to represent this in a way that feels intuitive. This motivates us to draw, draw a diagram, a frequency diagram to be more precise. And this is what we are going to do. We put the number, wait, let me make it consistent. We put the number k in the cell x, y, if and only if a k is equal to x, and the frequency of a k is equal to y. So like, if k is larger than this number, larger than n, you'll get that a k is, in, a k is equal to x and a k plus 1 is equal to y. Now to keep the video at a moderate pace and not too slow, I have skipped the construction process and here is what it looks like. What I did here is that I drew out an initial block and I drew the smallest square that contains the origin point that covers the entire block and I call it the, the red square. See this is, this is the initial sequence, the ones that I've written here in, in this block. I'm going to color this, highlight this as pink. And here n equals 7, which means that the rules of the problem only applies outside this block. Now what I do here is that I start with this number, right? Number 7 over here. And I reflect it over this line. Now you might ask what does reflection do? Well, the y-axis represents frequency, right? And the x-axis represents size. By reflecting it, I am turning its frequency into the size of the next number. 
So 7 here reflected does not move, but it has to be low, it has to go up because the previous space has already been filled. So A is written here. And right now these spots have been filled. Now A has frequency 4. Wait no. It's in column 3, so at this point in the sequence 3 has frequency 4. So it gets reflected here, drops down here. And now 9 is written here. The same thing goes on. Now 10 is written here. Observe that at one point in time, this red square must have no more numbers written on it, right? So what we observe is that at one point, it will just alternate between regions 2 and regions 3 like this. But wait, why is this region dead? Why is it completely dead? Nothing inhabits these lands, right? Well, to look at that, we need to look at the bijection between columns and rows. Sorry if I mess up columns or rows because I sometimes swap these, just a heads up. So, if you look at column 6 and row 6, you'll see that each number on the 6th row, they spawned number on the sixth column right and this is what happens if for some reason some weird number breaks this rule say 42 is written here or it could be anything else if something enters this dead zone it means that the frequency of that column is already larger than the size of this square and it means that the number of cells that have already been written in the corresponding row, which is this one, has to already exceed the width of that row, meaning that something has already entered the dead zone before. And since nothing is in this dead zone at, at the first, like when this process starts, nothing is in the dead zone, meaning that this will contradict its own minimality condition. So this zone is forever dead, nothing enters it. And what will happen is that the odds and even numbers are just going to be R2 and R3 alternating. So all we have to prove is that the sequence, which is the order of columns that numbers are put into R2, is eventually periodic. Like in this example, R3 is, is, it, R3 is just going to be the odd numbers, R2 is just going to be the even numbers. And we are interested in the order that these num as in like the order of columns that these numbers belong to. We want to show that it's periodic. Here is the hardest part. Remember that I said R2 and R3 are going to go back and forth like this, like with alternating arrows. Well, in the last claim, we only use one direction. We use the arrow from R2 to R3, but we never use the reverse. And when I said that this process is just flipping that number along the diagonal and letting gravity do its work, we never use the gravity. We never use the gravity even once. We just use that arrow and that's it. We prove that the dead zone is a thing and we need to prove that R2 is eventually periodic. But how do we use it and what resources does it bring? Well, one resource for sure is that R3 back to R2 is way more predictable because in R3, what actually matters is the y coordinates, right? The row that it's in. And with gravity there, it's pretty much unpredictable on a small scale. But R3 to R2, on the other hand, what's important is the column. Like, the row does not matter. We just care about the frequency and the size, right? Because these are R2 is the small numbers. And so, when you flip it back and Oh god, I thought my, my apple pencil died. When you flip it back and you let gravity do the work, it's, it's still pretty predictable, right? Because you know which column it's going to be in. And that's the most important part. Now, what does gravity do? Like, after some time T1, that, that red square stops getting more numbers, right? Like, at time T1, the red square gains no more 
numbers. For people who are confused about what time is, I view this process as like putting in one number per second. More numbers. After this point, every number written in R3 has to go to R2, right? And every number written in R2 except for the one right after T1 has to come from R3. So it's also sufficient to consider only the arrow from R3 to R2 from this point on. Well, it could be. Like, this arrow alone can give us some interesting properties, but it might not solve the problem. But well, let's give it a try. So what gravity does is that it ensures that this cell is filled before this cell before this cell, right? And what this means is that if we define R of I and T as number of cells in row I at time T and we define C I T as <laughs> in column I at time T, right? Then for all positive integers n are t plus 1 plus 2n. I know. R t plus 1 plus 2n n is constant. Now, why is this true? Well, remember that at time t, t1 plus 1, wait, I forgot to add one. At time t1 plus 1, you put a number in R2, right? And after that, you alternate between R3 and R2. So, at time t1 plus 1 plus 2n, the last cell that got a number written in it is in R2. So, there is a clear bijection going on. And it is a constant because if you know which cell, wait no, if you know which row the number is in in R three, you know the column that it goes to. And this is really important because the reverse does not hold. We do not know which which row something from R two is going to go to when it gets flipped because gravity exists. But you know that this thing is constant, and when you look at R I R of I and T1 plus 1 plus 2 N specifically, you'll see that there is a pattern because this cell cannot be written after this cell. Like, this one has to come first, this one comes second, and this one comes last, right? So, what happens is that R I Now, this is what happens. There's always at least as many new wait, no, not at least as many, but like, if you take the number of cells in the first row minus the cells in the second row, it cannot be too small, as in like, it cannot go too far into the negatives. It's bounded from below. Same as second row versus third row, right? So if you flip this back to the columns, it means that you can never have column 1 being way smaller than column 2. The difference if negative is bounded. Now, while that can never happen, what's to say that column 1 can never be way larger than column 2, right? Well, this is what happens. Let's say that at one point in time, for some positive integer L, columns 1 to L are larger than all of the columns L plus 1, L plus 2, and so on. Let's say that this happens at one point. There has to be a first time that this happens, right? And it has to be satisfied by the condition that something is written within columns 1 to L. 
that makes these columns larger than the rest. What happens is that this number right here gets flipped over the diagonal to a number in the region R3 that has a frequency of at most L. Because if you look at this line, like this line over here representing this row, this is the frequency of the number that you flip and get, right? Which is at most L, so it comes back to another number that is at most L. So this tower over here feeds itself and does not give anything to this poor area right here. And what happens is that these get discarded. The number of towers, at, no, no, not the number of columns that grow infinitely is going to shrink. And at one point, it is going to stop shrinking. And this means that for any two consecutive columns, the size difference is going to be bounded from both below and above. Because if it's not bounded from above, recall that for every two consecutive columns, it's bounded from below, right? So you can't have something like this, where this is really large. If column L is too much larger than column L plus 1, even if you minimize columns L minus 1, L minus 2, and so on, all of them are still going to be too large. So what happens over here is that the configuration that we are going to get if you subtract the height by the smallest height at that time within just region R2, it's finite. The number of configurations is finite. And if you add the information of which one is the last number added to the configuration, it is still finite because R2 has finitely many columns. So the same configuration has to repeat at least twice when time goes on, like when time goes on for really long. It's going to repeat. The entire thing is going to repeat by the pigeonhole hole principle. And so we are done with the problem because we have proven that the order in which numbers are put numbers are put into cells in R2 is periodic. At one wait not periodic, it's eventually periodic. The takeaway that I personally got from this problem is on duality because I'm going to admit the truth. When I solved this problem, I fluked the first part, I fluked the diagram. I found that in like 15 minutes with no, with no motivation. But I took most of the time in figuring this hardest part. This whole solve took me 2 hours. And while I did fluke the first part, I tried to figure out like what could have been the motivation for it. And I saw that this duality could have easily motivated the, the diagram. Because you want to visualize those two sides of the same coin. The second takeaway that I got from this problem is that you need to ask which resources you have not used yet. Because as I said, this whole thing, this hardest part is motivated by the fact that you want to use the arrow from R3 to R2. And at first I almost got into one trap which is that I want to delete R3 completely and deal with R2 on its own. But if I did that, that would have been disaster because I would have ignored the gravity completely. So the main thing about this problem is visualization, resourcefulness, and abstract thinking. I hope you enjoyed this episode as the next episode will be a friend of mine from Japan who scored 37 in IMO 2024, ranking, ranking him as the fourth high scorer in the world. And he's going to be presenting problem six so stay tuned, thank you for watching this episode. This is Celestia out, goodbye!